Hi, my name is Ellie Savitt. I'm the Washtenaw County Prosecuting Attorney. Uh, I went to elementary school here in Ann Arbor at the Hebrew Day School, uh, then went to Tappan Middle School, Pioneer High School, and I went to college at Kalamazoo College where I played basketball, majored in political science and philosophy, which uh, requires you to read a lot of books uh, to learn about uh, our politics, our government, uh, and uh, what we should and shouldn't be doing. Uh, I started my career as an eighth grade uh, U.S. history teacher. I taught American history in the New York City public schools, and now I am the Washtenaw County prosecuting attorney. Uh, the prosecutor is the unit of government. It's the person that uh, makes the decision when police arrest somebody uh, about whether to charge that person with a crime uh, and with what uh, they should be charged. And also uh, we go into court and if somebody is accused of a crime, uh, we are trying to make sure that there are consequences and that there are appropriate accountability for what they did. So uh, I'm really thrilled to be reading some books that uh, are really meaningful today. Um, and thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Today we are going to be reading Paper Sun. Uh, this is a book by Julie Lung and Chris Sasaki. Before he became an artist named Tyrus Wong, he was a boy named Wong Zheng Yo, who traveled with his father across a vast ocean to America, clutching a bundle of papers in his hand. The papers were not for drawing monkeys, which he loved to do. They were papers describing the life of another Chinese boy, whom Geng Yo was pretending to be. He had to memorize every word. In 1919, Chinese immigrants were not allowed into the United States unless they could prove they were citizens of high status, a scholar, a merchant, a business owner, or the child of such a citizen. So the boy's father pretended to be a merchant named Luk Git. Wang Zheng Yo became his son, Luk Tai Wo. He was now a Zijai, a paper son. Every night, the boy studied the answers to exacting questions. What are the names of the families who live in your village? Who is the leader of your district? How far is it to the next village? The immigration officials will ask me the same questions and compare our answers to make sure you are my son, his father said. If they do not match, you will be sent back and never see Gumsan. Gumsan means gold mountain in Cantonese. That was what the Chinese called America because of the opportunities there. See, his father would say, pointing to the horizon. Life in Gum San will be like a blank paper, and we will decide how to mark it. The boy followed his father's gaze to where Mater met the sky. Maybe he would spot a glimmer of Gold Mountain, too. At last, they arrived at Angel Island. His father, who had been in America before, cleared immigration quickly, but the boy was held back. Scared and alone, Zheng Yo was taken to a wooden house filled with strangers. There he waited. Days turned to weeks. This new land was not what he expected. The streets were not lined with gold. The barracks were crowded and dirty. He missed his father very much. There was no drawing paper, no ink, no paint. He watched the sun move slowly across the sky, always arching back towards the home he'd left behind. Finally, Zheng Yo was brought in front of three men who bombarded him with questions. 
How many windows does your house have? What direction does your village face? Where did you go to school? The boy was nervous, but he remembered all his answers from the coaching papers his father had given him. He was released from Angel Island. His father was waiting for him with arms outstretched. Now we must look for opportunities, he said. At school in Sacramento, Wong Zheng Yo was given a new name by his teachers, a name that combined his real name and his paper name. Tai Yo was Americanized to Tyrus, Tyrus Wong. Tyrus did not like school. He preferred sketching to science, doodles to diagrams, art to arithmetic. Tyrus's father had been well-educated in China, but to be a Chinese immigrant was to be a servant, a laundryman, a waiter. And to find these jobs, he often had to travel far, leaving Tyrus alone for months. Still, his father believed life in America could be like a blank paper. One day, he brought home a brush and made Tyrus practice Chinese calligraphy. Because they could not afford ink and paper, Tyrus wrote with water on old newspapers. And after the paper dried, his father would say, one more time. His father borrowed enough money to send Tyrus to Otis Art Institute in Los Angeles. Tyrus learned to paint and draw in the Western style, smudging thick charcoal to form shadows and mirroring the way light hits objects. He also studied artwork from China's Song Dynasty, when watercolors and simple lines communicated much by showing little. The lushness of a flower could be felt with gradual increases of color, and mountains could loom in the distance with a few jagged lines. In the evenings, Tyrus mopped the floor as the school janitor. He swirled the soapy water around, the mop dancing in his hands like a paintbrush. Tyrus graduated at the top of his class and began working as an in-betweener at Walt Disney Studios. In the early days of animation, in-betweeners drew the frames in between a movie's key arts, the same scenes over and over, with only small changes each time to create the feeling of movement. The work was boring, and his eyes throbbed. One day, Tyrus heard that Disney was making a movie called Bambi, about a young deer who must learn to survive without his mother. But the animators were having trouble creating the backgrounds. Tyrus thought about the mother he had left behind in China, and the father who always believed in him. He thought about his style of painting one that combined East and West, his past and his present. Tyrus saw an opportunity. He spent days painting landscapes. Instead of drawing a forest scene, leaf by leaf, tree by tree, he created the feeling of woods and mountains with sparse brush strokes and soft watercolors. Where other artists might use 10 strokes of a brush, he used five. The result was breathtaking. Walt Disney loved it. He instructed his animators to follow Tyrus's style. Bambi became a groundbreaking film. Audiences and critics gushed about the art, how it communicated so much by showing so little, how you could almost smell the mossy green of the woods and hear the rushing water of the brook. But in the end, Tyrus was credited only as a background artist. Walt Disney Studios fired Tyrus after an employee strike, even though he did not participate. It would be many years before the world saw Tyrus Wong for the artist that he was. But Tyrus never stopped painting, and not just on paper. Throughout his life, he would draw his art on ceramics, silk scarves, murals, menus. Tyrus always found new ways to leave his mark. As an old man,
Pyrus discovered a love of kites, caterpillars and pandas, fish and butterflies. He would tell people he wanted to be looking up. How else could one see Gold Mountain? On sunny days, you could often find Tyrus Wong on the beach, facing the ocean he crossed so long ago, flying a large colorful kite he'd made himself, glimmering gold where water met the sky. The end.